Hi everyone, I'm George Choi. And I'm Sarah Choi. And wow, it's been such a long time together. since I've done one of these. I've forgotten that she's here. <laughs> Sarah, hello. She is here. She does. Exist. Yeah, people, I do. People have been asking me. People have messaged. Is Sarah, is Sarah alive? You know? Yes, uh, I am here. Yep, she is here. She Children is, she at is school. Real. I am back in the game. That's it. Uh, so today, uh, so welcome to the Sarah and George Choi Property Podcast. Uh, it's the show that helps you to become financially free so you can spend time with your family travel, which is what we're going to talk about today, and pursue your passions. Mm -hmm. And today I have the pleasure of interviewing Mo Clark on how to travel the world with kids, something I'm very interested in. Yeah. So Mo spent two years, so this is a long time, two continuous years, traveling to 34 countries with three young children. I, I mean, know. that just sounds like, oh, good grief. <laughs> so we, we thought we'd ask her how she managed to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's the kind of thing that most people think about doing when they've retired they don't think about doing it you know so mm. so young in life um so you know we have two young kids um under 10 um and uh you know we'd like we'd like to really pick a brain see what it was like um the good and the bad because there's, there's obviously going to be some mistakes out there that we want to know about and people can avoid and how, how she scored her children because our children hate homeschooling um they, <laughs> it results in a lot of screaming yeah. so. <laughs> maybe she has different type of children yes yeah, so, i don't know we're gonna ask we'll find out. <laughs> um so we want to you know we also want to know the nuts and bolts of uh you know how to do it so Welcome, Mo. Hooray! Hello. Hi. <laughs> thanks, thanks for coming on. It's just a pleasure to have you here today. Um, and I guess I wanted to really start with, you know, how on earth did you get the idea to do it in the first place? It's not something that people think, oh, yeah, let's just go around the world for two years with, with all these kids, take them out of school. So how did that come around? Well, uh, I guess we, we were quite big travellers anyway. Um, I had had a, a gap year in my 20s and a kind of a bit more sim simple gap year without children mm -hmm. um, and um, Martin had spent some time in South America doing um, like Operation Rally type sort of projects a couple of times and and so I kind, it kind of felt like it was in our blood and then we had kids and went oh hmm. I have to stop hmm. you know can, can we not do this stuff um, and uh, so we traveled with, with them from quite young on just normal holiday type stuff. And we, I think quite quickly, we, we were, maybe we were lucky, but we were okay with sort of going on planes. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a few different trips, but there was just this feeling like, you know, we didn't want to wait until retirement and we wanted more. And I was kind of trapped in a fairly intense, um, you know, full-time corporate job. Um, and I felt as if I was missing my kid's childhood. Yeah. Um, my husband ran his own business. He was at home a little bit more, but even so, we had au pairs at home that were seeing more of our kids than, than we were. Yeah. And um, I, I worked for a company that at the time offered sabbaticals and you could have, um, you could have, I think you could have a year um, unpaid, but you could have six months paid if you did something worthy. And I had this, this, this kind of idea started forming in my head. I was coming up to 10 years and I think you needed to be in the company 10 years to qualify. And as I approached the 10 years, it was like, you know what? The kids are kind of an okay age that it wouldn't matter if they miss school. Mm -hmm. And I have this real passion to kind of go and do something cool and worthy somewhere. And whether that's going to South America, could we get away? Would the company let us do six months paid in some project in South America and then another six months traveling unpaid, etc.? cetera? So yeah, what were the children at the time? Uh, I think when the idea started, our youngest, Lara, was, pro I think they were probably all under five as this okay. idea started forming. Mm -hmm. And we started, we started talking about it and we were like, okay, well, I'll have come up to 10 years in another year or two. Um, I think we went around through a couple of sort of redundancy threats and I managed to sort of cling on and keep my job <laughs> and go on. And we, we kind of got to the idea that, actually we didn't want our eldest to be much older than nine or ten right. and we didn't want our youngest to be much younger than three or four mm. um and for some people that might be too young but our youngest was fairly adventurous and fairly 
cold and you know it kind of felt that that would be an okay time and then just as the the plan started getting a bit better the company stopped doing sabbaticals oh that's a bit annoying yeah. <laughs> um, but um you know a, another year or so passed as we sort of kind of pondered what to do and uh I ended up taking redundancy from the company, um, which, uh, you know, put, put some money in the bank and I really needed a break and it was really the right time to say, you know what, we need to do this. And actually, at, at the same time, I'd, I'd been diagnosed with um, arthritis and it was another sort of, you know, do it now or maybe you'll never do it. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you'll be in a wheelchair in five years or... <laughs> You know, Which I'm glad to say I'm not. <laughs> Sometimes it's <laughs> none of that. It's faction though, can't it? So it's, you know, mm-hmm. although not great, it probably really helped push you along a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. You lose your job, you know, you get diagnosed with something and it's, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Something's good. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, we, we were like, actually, we can make this happen. Or everything's kind of, you know, it was kind of lining up in the stars or whatever the expression is. And yeah. um, so we just started to make it happen. And, and Martin started to kind of get his ducks in a row for mm-hmm. leaving his company in the capable hands of his MD so that he could kind of, he could be fairly hands off for a year. And we, we kind of thought a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when we started figuring out about letting the house out, and talking to the mortgage company, they were like, okay, well, you can't, you can't do it for more than two years. And we went, oh, two years. <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of, we didn't really say anything about two years to anyone, but the two years was kind of in the back pocket, kind of okay. privately as that could happen. Between um, one and two. Yeah. And then we started looking at, at what, it's really silly things like we put a massive world map up on the wall and kept sort of sitting in front of it with a cup of coffee going "Mm, east or west where is it going to be summer you know (laughs) (laughs) and I started doing the research into if we're going to do some volunteering stuff what on earth can you do with three kids yeah how's that going to work in the past and it's you know Say the family went one of you would be volunteering the other one would basically be child caring the entire time yeah it's and we didn't really want that mm. we want i wanted to do something where they would kind of be involved yeah and it would be somehow meaningful whether that meant that we were going to be living in some kind of community and the kids would be involved with other kids or going to school or whatever mm. um and i found a company i don't know if they still exist called kaya volunteering and they had sort of, uh, this is really after quite a few dead ends, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> we went to some forums and all sorts of stuff. We met lots of companies and they were like, mm. <laughs> Yeah. But Kaya were really different and they had quite a lot of stuff going on in South America. And they said, okay, we're going to go away and see what we can find. And unbelievably, they came back and said, we've got quite a big volunteering program in the Galapagos. We, we, we sort of, signed up to do um four or five weeks um working in a school mm-hmm. where i was going to be a teaching assistant and martin was going to kind of be a computer support technician person <laughs> in the department and the yeah. kids were actually going to go to the school oh, oh wow. cool um and we kind of put September in as the possible time and it was it was a bit flexible which was just as well um, and uh, then we figured out that we could get to Rio on um, all of my air miles added together um, and it, on a date that was a few days after the kids were going to break up for the summer in July 2012 and and from that things kind of started to fall into place and and then it was a case of, okay, we know where we're going. We're going to land in Rio. We're going to do some stuff in South America. And yep. we're going to somehow get to the Galapagos. And we're not sure if we're going east or west. And I had read something about this amazing, fairly hardcore, I think I've read it in the Lonely Planet book, mm-hmm. about going up the Amazon on a cargo boat. <laughs> um, <Right>. And, and <laughs> as you do. 
Um, so, you know, did quite a lot of research into whether we could maybe make that work. Nothing kind of got firmed up, but it was a bit of an idea and we had a bit of a bit of a route planned vaguely. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like, well, you know, if that doesn't work, we can always fly and internal flights aren't too bad, etc. Yeah. etc. Yeah. Um, and then we started looking at all the sort of practical things like insurance. We realized that you could get a one year family gap insurance, but it was going to cost twice as much if it included North America and the Caribbean. So we were like, okay, North America and Caribbean's out. Right? <laughs> you can go there anytime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we started thinking about school. Um, we were kind of lucky, I think, in that the kids um, were attending a little private um, prep school. Yeah. And I think it might be a bit harder if your kids, uh, you know, in state school, because you maybe have a little bit more red tape to cut through to, to, you know, to convince people that it's all okay. But I know plenty of people that have done that. But for us, it was kind of, oh my goodness, we're very jealous. Have a nice time. They'll probably learn far more going around the world for a year than they would here. Um, and uh, see you when you get back. I'm sure there'll be space. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, um, you know, kids said goodbye to their friends, and we found a tenant for the house oh, um, who wanted who wanted the house for a year and seemed quite keen on the idea of more time if there was going to be more time. Right. So, so that was pretty oh, good, yeah. and we packed everything up and tried to let as much furnished as possible, and then we got on a plane to Rio. So that's us setting off from Heathrow. That's all the baggage that we had. Nice, clean-looking rucksacks. All the kids had a little day bag. That's not a lot of stuff. <laughs> it really wasn't that much stuff. And I have to say, wow. packing it was one of... We nearly got divorced just packing because, <laughs> uh, you know, I'd got all these school books that I wanted to take and, and everything was pretty full-on. And I think Martin made us repack about 27 times. Right. And he was like, you don't need that. You don't need that. Why do you need 10 T-shirts? You can have five. Um, you know. yeah. <laughs> so how old are the children here? So um, Ben um, was nine, mm-hmm. Zoe was seven, and Lara was four. So I, I talked to all the teachers that they would have been going into the year of, um, encouraged them all to have maps of the world, and they had little laminated Ben, Zoe and Lara's, and, and the, actually it was only Zoe's teacher that embraced that, and there was quite a lot of interaction between her and the teacher in the class, and yeah. they had a, where in the world is Zoe, and they would move her around the map. And, oh, that's nice. Fun. That's but, nice. Uh, yeah, Ben and Lara's teachers didn't really embrace that, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they all gave me kind of curriculums and uh, workbooks and suggested things um and I was ready to take maybe 10 works workbooks or so in the bottom of my case and Martin was like we have an iPad Mm -hmm. we have a computer you're not carrying you're not carrying that lot it's not happening (laughs) (laughs) we'll figure it out so (laughs) Yeah. We didn't have those things. We did. Acqu- I did end up acquiring some things like that along the way, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the kids in front of um, Cristo Redentor in um, in Rio. So uh, yes, we had booked um, an Airbnb mm-hmm. little apartment in the middle of Rio for a week, and yeah. um, I booked that about three days before we left. Mm-hmm. Under, under duress from a friend who was like, she said, I'm just actually going to have a breakdown if you don't book something. Please, please just book something. I'll bear it. Um, and she sat me down and she went, just log on and book something now. <laughs> so just for your friend's state of mental health. Well, no, I think yeah. having at least somewhere to land. I mean, doesn't, do the visa people not need you to have somewhere to stay? When South you're... America's pretty straightforward. Um, right. It's all visa on entry. Um, but we have been told that you could come unstuck on any border if you haven't got proof of exit. So one of the things that I did was I booked a fully flexible flight out of Santiago in Chile Mm -hmm. to Easter Island. Yeah, so you know you could get there in the end. Because that was a thing on the bucket list, you know, Mm -hmm. we wanted to go to Easter Island. Martin had wanted to go there when he was in Chile sort of 15 years earlier. 
and hadn't been able to. And we thought we really, I had this bucket list thing about the Pacific. I wanted to island hop across the Pacific, although I hadn't fully grasped until I looked at it more closely that it's not the same as island hopping around Greece. <laughs> further away. <laughs> <A bit> bigger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But um, yeah, so we had that flight and it was completely flexible. And I think I changed the dates about six times mm. um, and we were never asked ever for proof of exit, but it was kind of good. It, it gave us a, mm. a, a thing in the plan to, yeah. to work to. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we landed in Rio and we got to our apartment and the guy that rented us the apartment was super friendly um, he was from Bolivia and um, it was his mum's apartment and he showed us all over Rio wow. um, and kind of, you know, straight away we felt like we'd hit the ground running really um, by finding a local who was, who sort of helped us to settle in um, and uh, with nothing planned, we actually spent quite a lot of time just planning you know the days were we instead of being tourists and saying we've got to go out and see everything mm. you know we, we we kind of you know maybe spent half the day in the apartment sort of thinking about breakfast having <laughs> 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 breakfast going to the shop for whatever was forgotten um and uh i think you know it was the beginning of really wasn't that many years since smartphones had been introduced and the fact that we could be on our smartphones googling stuff um everywhere unbelievably in 2012 in south america had good wi-fi um mm. almost better than europe and um you know my first gap year 20 years earlier was all with lonely planets you know you carried around these big big sorts mm. of <laughs> the lonely planet and you thumbed through it and you worked out what you were going to do and and then and then you basically showed up a, 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 a you know good looking accommodation that you like the look of and they said no we're full or they'd shut down or yeah. <laughs> Whereas suddenly we were able to email we were able to call we were you know it, it really did make a massive difference yeah um, so everything was much much more sort of digital um, and you know, booking.com became our best friend, um, mm-hmm. etc. And and we slowly started to, you know, add different chunks. We managed to um, to book ourselves into um, an amazing little beach house on an island about a hundred miles south of Rio, mm-hmm. um, called Ila Grande, and. Um, it, it was it belonged to an architect and she wanted a stupid amount of money for it um, and and I inquired and she said this is it this much and I was like oh dear it's out of my budget <laughs> and she looked at our blog and she went well it's not booked I guess I could let you have it for less <laughs> nice. you put it on your blog. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> we got a cheap week in this amazing beach house on this right. little island and again you know we started to sort of settle in and and um, yeah, this this where Lara's sitting in the in the bottom right here. She's sitting in the window of the beach house, wow. and uh, above that is the view from the beach house along the beach. Wow, that's a nice. Um, <laughs> just, Man, just. you're making me so jealous, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go. Although, although it was the source of one of our first crises because the kids basically spent like the whole. 10 days that we were there, well, all of us did just sort of barefoot and you walked up the beach and through the trees and you were in the sort of sandy village and uh, it it really was kind of idyllic. Um, We trekked over, you can see this kind of like rainforest in the interior. We trekked over that to another amazing beach the other side and I ran every morning up and down the beach. It was lovely. Sometime later, um, when we were on the Amazon on a cargo boat with no access to any kind of medical anything. Oh, you you made it then onto your cargo boat? (laughs) Did make it. Did. Did make it via quite a few different hops through Brasilia and other islands and so on. But on on the cargo boat, Ben said, I've got this funny spot on my toe, mummy. Mm. Um, And he had um, something called a jigger worm in his toe. Oh. And um, it had it had obviously burrowed its way in from running around in on um, you know in the sand barefoot, which we had been subsequently told was an absolute no no. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, we kind of looked back and thought, you know, a couple of locals did tell the kids to put their shoes on. And we kind of didn't really think anything of it, yeah. <laughs> stupidly. Um, but, um, you know, Martin sterilized a needle and excavated this, this thing on his foot, on, right by his little toe. Um, and, and took out all of the little eggs that the jigger worm had laid. Oh, oh. It was utterly disgusting. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's where you want your Google looking up how to remove a worm from your foot. Yeah, I know. Amazingly, Martin kind of recognised it from his experiences in South America before, I think. He, uh, oh, that was you got on the cargo boat, and then where did you get to next? So uh, the cargo boat took us basically from the mouth of the Amazon for a week up to um, the city of Manaus, which is right in the middle of the Amazon jungle. And from there, we, we did um, a, a few days of a kind of a bit slightly touristy, but an adventure that you have to be taken out on, mm -hmm. you know, um, with a guide. I think I've got some pictures, actually. Oh, this is the cargo boat. Oh, okay. um, Cool. Basically, we were with all these people that lived up the Amazon that had been down to Belém, the um, the city at the mouth of the Amazon. They they'd done their shopping for the year, um, and they were heading back up. And they basically would string their hammocks up in this public deck, and um, and everybody lived together with all their hammocks, and everybody slept together, and everybody sat around and ate together, and so on. We were pretty scared about losing our luggage. Um, <laughs> or, or the children or yeah, yeah. but we also wanted the experience of, of of the of the hammock thing and so we we managed to rent this tiny weeny little cabin that you see on the right where i'm reading a story apparently to the children mm -hmm. um and uh it was air conditioned and actually at least three of us could manage to sleep in there and two could sleep in the hammocks on the deck Right. Uh, it was far more pleasant sleeping in the hammocks because you had this amazing breeze and warmth, whereas the aircon was just too cold and yeah. you know, right by the engine room. But it, we did have our tiny little bathroom in there. So rather than use the horrific public bathrooms on the boat, <laughs> we, we did have a little bit of first world luxury, um, which, which was, uh, which was great. Um, and uh, it was just, it was an incredible week. Food was horrific. It was horrible rice and beans, um, which we got a bit fed up with after about the fourth day. But, you yeah. know, it was okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then we got on a plane and we flew to the Galapagos. Mm. And um, in the Galapagos, we, we started our, we were put, we were housed in a little, um, in a lick, tiny little apartment. And um, we kind of got settled in for a couple of days. We were welcomed by um, a guy called Teacher Willie, who was much respected around the island and organised all the sort of volunteering, ran an English school completely manned by volunteers mm -hmm. uh, for kids that were enthusiastic to come and learn English, you know, in the afternoon, having gone to school in the morning. Yeah. And he had, he had set us up in the local school. And um, we... Uh, and I think my next picture kind of, you can see me there uh, sitting at my desk. Um, this, was, this was probably one, of, another of my most scary moments. Um, and one of my biggest sort of flight or fight moments of my life. Um, I was taken down to my classroom where I was going to be a teaching assistant. Introduced me to the class and I'm looking around. There's no teacher. Um, and I'm like, where's the teacher? She says, ah, you're the teacher. Oh, no. <laughs> year four, 30 year four children bouncing around, throwing paper aeroplanes, screaming, shouting in Spanish. Um, and I was like, oh, oh. There's, been, there's been a small misunderstanding. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and she gives me this textbook and says, you know, this is social studies. And if you turn it over, that's maths and so on and so forth. Um, anyway, I, I decided to give it my best shot. And uh, I, I kind of muddled through a week of teaching these kids. Um, <laughs> obviously, obviously, the curriculum and the, uh, and the timetable went out the window, but we had a lot of fun. And it was all about sort of, you know, 
teaching them as much English as possible and doing maths in English and, you know, Spanish. And um, the kids settled into their classes. Martin fixed up about 30 broken computers (laughs) and so on. And um, and then um, I fell over in the street the following weekend and I split my knee open and had to have seven stretch oh. stitch. Um, and things sort of changed a bit. One of the kids, the, the littlest one, Lara, didn't quite fit into school. They put her as four, four year old with a bunch of six year olds and it was all a little bit too overwhelming. So she moved to the local kindergarten. Mm-hmm. Zoe, who was seven, um, she's quite shy. She was struggling to settle in. Yeah. And um, someone came up with the idea that she could be at the kindergarten and she could be a teaching assistant. Yeah. So she became a teaching assistant, age seven, at the kindergarten. Yeah. <laughs> and Ben just thrived. Ben just had an absolute last. These were his two best friends mm-hmm. uh, down on the bottom right, um, Juan and I can't remember his, the other guy's name. But um, And then we, Zoe and I spent our afternoons in the English school and there's a picture of her there with some of the kids learning, helping them to, you know, doing sort of speak, talking practice really yeah. right. um, and chatting. And she and I got involved in another project where we were sort of painting hopscotch on school playgrounds and things like that. So one way or another, we muddled through our month and we, you know, it worked out great. So that was fantastic. Brilliant. Uh, and, you know, in our spare time, we, uh, we, we just saw animals everywhere. You kind mm. of walked along the, the street at lunchtime and there would be sort of uh, sea, seals and sea lions just lolloping in the street. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All over the beach and um, there would be, uh, you know, ig- iguanas everywhere and so on. Wow. So it really was a very special month and it's what everyone, the kids will always remember it and talk about the highlights, one of the highlights being the Galapagos. Yeah, I mean, in my mind, I didn't think anybody lived there. Neither did I. <laughs> so how big a population is it? I mean... Tiny. There's, there's lots of islands, but there's three big ones. Mm-hmm. And we were on the middle, middling one, and each of those three islands has one town, and the rest is, is just, you know, nothing and tiny, tiny roads. Okay. And every one of them's got sort of conservation centres and, and, and so on. Um, when we finished with our, our volunteering, we, we were lucky enough to be able to fly to the other two islands and spend a few days on each of those. And they're all a little bit different yeah. sort of experiences. So, so that was just incredible. Um, you know, and, and we realised that we, we got to do what most people pay thousands and thousands and thousands to do on cruises. Yeah. Um, and, and we felt that, well, I felt that the experience was 100 times better because we became part of the community. And exactly. yeah. I mean, you had to be a lot braver to do that, but you had an experience you'd never forget. Experience, yeah. yeah. Mm. So we, could, we could probably spend a couple of Great. days um, yeah. talking about every single item on your, on your trip. So just mm. to get, say, jump to the end of your trip. Yeah. So what was the point where you said, uh, okay, we have to go home now? Um, and what was it like then arriving back in the UK? Okay, well, we, after South America, we, we made the decision to do a second year because we were like, oh, nine months, haven't made it around the world, um, only made it around South America. Um, and there's so much more that we want to do. So we made the commitment to the second year mm-hmm. um, and we started to plan our route for the second year. Um, and it was a little bit more chaotic than the first year. Um, you know, one of the one of the harder things that that we discovered, especially going into the second year, was that uh, spending twenty four seven in each other's company, parenting twenty four seven together, can really start to show any wrinkles and difficulties and um, differences between you as a couple and a par- and, and parents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, we, I found it increasingly hard uh, as as the time went on that we didn't really agree on a huge amount of stuff. Um, so you know that that made it harder. It did it, it didn't ruin things, but it definitely made it harder. And you know I, 
we'd, we'd, we'd meet up with other people and um, uh, we found an amazing traveling families Facebook group and we went out of our way to meet other people because you just kind of were craving <laughs> adult company adult company and friendship that was more than just meeting someone you know for 30 minutes in a in a cafe or on a street or yeah. whatever um, but you know as as year two progressed we we knew we couldn't rent the house out any longer and our mortgage terms said we kind of needed to go back and the kids had had two years out of school um and it was just time everyone was ready to go home all of us felt like we got it out of our system which was amazing which we definitely hadn't after one year Um, and it was a case of well you know we can go home july august time and we can be ready to hit the new school year in september yeah that's it's it's the obvious thing to do yeah yeah was your older son going into year seven at that point he was that's quite a big transition isn't it it was huge although he was going to he went back to private school where you stay in the junior school till the end of year eight oh okay Uh, year seven and eight is is the years leading up to some fairly big exams for getting place at senior school right Um, he he was the probably the hardest one to to homeschool. I mean, we quickly stopped calling it homeschool because it really wasn't, and and yeah, called it was world school. school. <laughs> um, very much world school, and we met a lot of people that talked about and and did something that's a real thing called unschooling. I don't know if you've heard of it. But just um, not doing any kind of school. What it is is it's you're not you're not doing traditional school, but you are following the passions and interests of your children, and you're you're using that and kind of latching on to whatever is right for them and, and adapting everything you know to their their sort of style, um, and and the whole schooling thing for me was just a huge journey of being adaptable and changing and trying and finding something new, and eventually. We, we had a different model for each of the three kids. Yeah. Um, we, had, we found an amazing lady that did some online sort of Zoom style um, English and, and history type um, work with Ben and a little bit with Zoe. And she, she was English, she kind of knew the system, she knew what he needed to know and she got him focused on some English stuff that was gonna help. Okay. We found the most incredible maths app that um, they just did every single day and it just kept them on track with the, with the maths that they needed and they hit the ground running there. Um, and, you know, Lara was basically probably the, the most fun for me, having the privilege of teaching your child to read and write and start maths and doing that stuff that they, they all, you know, we hand them over to a teacher to do. Yeah. Mm. And, and that was amazing. And, and she totally led that. You know, I completely had to adapt it to her and tried lots and lots and lots of different sort of media, lots of things online. Um, there's so many good things that you can use. Um, so, you know, and it was all little and often we'd have sort of, you know, a little bit of, um, I'd set them something every morning before breakfast, you know, even if it was a tiny little, um, you know, English exercise of some kind, some little grammar thing or some little thing where, you know, you've got to find the similes or something, you know, whatever it would yeah, be. Yeah. Plus they, they had to do sort of two, two units of maths a day, which only took about 20 minutes. Okay. If that, but they did it every day and it was enough. Um, and, uh, and they, I even got to the stage, which sounds a bit like bribery and corruption, but all the work <laughs> I did was <laughs> pocket money. Um, yeah, yes. and you know they had the bank of mum which was a little note in my phone and you know whatever they did each day they could earn up to something like I can't remember you know 50 cents or something yeah. um, you know for, for if they did the required five bits of work which included you know 10 minutes of reading 10 minutes of maths etc and everything else was about learning as we went and learning about yeah. culture and history and museums and and, right. and Stuff like that, which which was just a brilliant way of learning. Definitely. I mean, it's the kind of the English and the maths, I think, that are probably the most important to kind of... Yeah. they will be most behind, I guess, if they go back into sort of national curriculum afterwards. Yeah. Lara, Lara was 
hundred percent there with her reading, but she was a bit behind on her writing. She went into year two. Um, and, but you know, to her credit and to the teacher's credit, the teacher said, this is, this is why in Sweden, they don't send the kids to school till seven. I understand now because I see how Lara is, you know, she's thirsty for it. She's ready. Um, and it probably took her a year to catch up on her writing, but it wasn't a problem. You know, it was, it was fine. She just had more interesting things to write about. (laughs) (laughs) Zoe was the studious one and I could just pick up a writing book, a workbook, an English book, and she would just devour it. So she hit the ground running. Um, The maths, as I say, this maths app was just staggeringly good. What's it called? um, It's called Doodle Maths. Um, At the time it was free. They do now charge and it's designed as a top up to support children in English schools doing maths. Yeah. Um, it absolutely it teaches in bite-sized chunks and then it sends little tests out and it it says oh you're not getting that right and it reteaches things that you're not getting right uh, and it awards you stars and you use yeah, this well they need that yeah oh, absolutely brilliant we ended up you know the kids ended up getting in touch with the people that that designed it and ran it and they ended up designing things for the app because they used it so much which was fantastic yeah um, so yeah, Ben, a bit more of a struggle because he is just hopeless at applying himself. So we had quite a few battles, mm. uh, but you know, he's he survived. He uh, took his GCSEs last year and uh, muddled through. So yeah, you know, I mean, you know, children are all very different anyway, aren't they? That's yeah. the thing. So you know, had he even been in school, school, he possibly would have had the same kind of issues. You wow. just wouldn't have to been doing it yourself yeah somebody <laughs> really paying i mean one alternative is to take a teacher with you <laughs> Just there are so many different things you know yeah. you can do and it is all about being adaptable and i think if you know if you go for a year you almost the teachers at our school said you know don't worry if they don't do anything it won't matter for a year wow. and that was from their teachers wow. yeah. i was thinking really no i'm not i don't agree with that <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah yeah, yeah. Wow. So I'm sure, you know, one thing that's going to cross everyone's mind is how much money do you need? How do you, how do you fund it? How do you fund it? How do you live? Um, So what? what, And your partner was working, wasn't he at the time? So So he had a company um, which was being run for him. Mm -hmm. Um, He he would sort of have times when he would need to spend a bit more time, you know, and then the kids and I would go off on outings and he'd stay in a hotel room and do a bit of work or take a phone Mm -hmm. call. And there was a couple of times when he spent two or three weeks fairly connected with work and not very connected with the trip, but not too much. Yeah. Um, so that helped. Um, my redundancy package was extremely helpful. Yeah. Um, that made a massive difference. Renting out the house, paid the mortgage and gave us a bit more on top. No, that's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that was really helpful. Um, and that was it, really. Um, Do you have a budget? I mean, how, how did you plan for... I'm going to make it through the year and not run out of money. I mean, did you have like a nightly budget or food budget? No, we, we, we really didn't. Um, <laughs> they just winged it. <laughs> kind of did wing it. Um, oh. I mean, I, I, when I did my trip around the world in 1992, we did it for 10 grand for two of us. But right. we, had a, we had a round the world ticket that we bought before we left. So that was, that was covered, you know, and that cost about 800 pounds. Um, whereas, you know, this trip, we, as I say, we had the first flight on air miles. The second flight ex- was the most expensive one that we, we had, you know, bought up front and everything else we did along the way. And, and you know, I, th- I think that probably a flight for five, the average flight for five was probably about $500. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some were cheaper, some were more expensive. And we did over 50 flights. Wow. Um, which means that we spent probably over getting up to forty thousand pounds on flights in two years right and you know it was a case of uh, you know have we got enough money to mm-hmm. do this can we keep going and when we ran out of money we knew we would go home 
Mm. Uh, you know, and we did manage to eke it out. And obviously, Martin had an income coming in. So when my redundancy was gone, you know, he 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 sort of covered the last few months. Um, yeah. But I mean, I guess you could have done it cheaper had you not moved around so much. Totally. I mean, you, it really is a case of what is your budget. And our budget was a little bit, un, well, it wasn't, of course, it wasn't unlimited, but you know, <laughs> we did stuff on the cheap. But, and we chose cheaper countries in the main. Right. Uh, yes. And, you know, there were times when, like, we stayed in Cambodia in Siem Reap for one month and the hotel was $20 a night. That was one of the cheapest things we did, which for five people is pretty cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and, um, you know, but then we always were a bit on the indulgent side with eating out. You know, we would, we would eat cheap for a while and then we'd go, oh, look, was that really nice sushi restaurant? Um, and that was going to cost first world prices. You know, we spent $60 on a meal right. uh, or maybe more. Um, you know, we, we yeah. found some amazing Michelin starred restaurant, you know, in some unusual place in some city and Martin was like we're going <laughs> you know and I was like oh we just spent $200 uh, <laughs> so you know it rice and beans <laughs> make and then in somewhere like India you know I think the second year we were less cost conscious mm-hmm. as we were coming towards the end and it was like you know what we're in India and we're a bit fed up with the fact that when we stand on a station to get a train, um, you know, we're surrounded by 50 people that are just right in front of us staring at us. And we are not going to go to the cheapest accommodation. We probably could have had accommodation for $5 a night, but we we chose a five-star hotel for $40 a night. Right. um, Because it was still only $40. Yes. I mean, (laughs) would you like rent an apartment every time with the children? I mean, what kind of size place were you renting very varied but i'm you know hostels mostly didn't work mm, because yes. some, occasionally a hostel with with five beds in a room could work yeah. um, but nearly all the time it was some for booking.com was definitely the place we booked on the most mm-hmm. um, you know so little hostily um B and B, small hotels, yeah. very varied, and and because they were so little, one of the beautiful things was that you could get a triple room, and that worked for five, because oh, you know, Lara was very easy to sort of like sleep in our bed, yeah. um, and the other two could top and tail in a third bed, or you know, we we carried. Um, very small sleeping we carried two sleeping bags child size sleeping bags and we carried two blow up very small very compact mattresses yeah. so actually two kids could sleep on the floor and yeah. and be comfortable and that worked on a lot of occasions so, uh, good tip <laughs> it's very much how much are you willing to spend and what what are you willing to to be budget wise on um, and what your children tolerate <laughs> really true yeah. <laughs> that's very true yeah uh, i think i became less tolerant as the time went on if i'm like right. less of an adventure woohoo now i want my own room please mum. <laughs> exactly exactly and, and we were we getting more and more, and more about when we got back and and you know how it was going to be and <laughs> yeah so how about some of the other logistical things like you know what about um bills in the uk and bank statements and all that kind of thing how did you keep I'm on track of on track of that, making sure things are done. We had a person. Got <laughs> <laughs> to have someone. I mean, when I did it in 1992, it was my mum, bless her. So you know, she. I kind of left her sort of detailed instructions, and she managed it for me. Oh, okay. um, this for this trip, um, it was um, it was Haley who was uh, you know Martin's office assistant. So we rerouted all of our mail to his office mm-hmm. and. She very kindly did stuff for us and she would scan stuff and send it to us and say, what shall I do with this? Or, you know, most stuff can be filed, can't it? Let's face it. Uh, Yeah, yeah, there's only a few things you need to actually do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of times we had to have, you know, a long distance, fairly long phone call with 
an accountant to do our annual tax return. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> from a jungle somewhere. Yeah. It was done from a jungle, yes. Oh, wow. right. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, these days, it's a lot easier to do that kind of, you can do yeah. somebody from the other end of the world if it comes down to it. Visas were mostly, again, there was a couple of things that we couldn't do because it just wasn't going to work. Um, uh, but most of them were visa on entry. Um, China, we managed to sort out in Hong Kong. India was very difficult. We had to sort it out from Sri Lanka and it was all touch and go whether we were going to be able to fly into India. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we managed it. Is there anything, is there anything else you think, kind of finally, that um, people would need to make sure they, have, they, they do in advance of taking such a tr- such a long trip with the mm. kids well the big pros and the cons you know because i mean you know this is something mm. that it's a romantic dream for mm. many yeah. Yeah. So yeah what would you need to know we did, we did a practice run i didn't i didn't get to mention that but oh, right. what was how did you do your practice run a year earlier um we bought flights to return flights to uh bangkok mm-hmm and uh, a couple of nights, the first couple of nights in an okay hotel in, um, in Bangkok. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we got there, we organized um, to go to Cambodia. We went overland, I think we went in a taxi, to be honest, to the border, yeah. uh, negotiated the border crossing, which was fairly <laughs> complex um, experience. And then we went down to Siem Reap where Martin actually had a friend that had married a local girl. And we stayed with them and uh, then we came back and then we went to some of the islands in Thailand um, and we sort of did it as we went. So it was kind of how are the kids doing? Yeah. How do we cope with the kids doing stuff as you go? Right. Yeah. And how, how long was how long was that for? It was only, I can't remember, about two and a half weeks, I think, over, over Christmas holidays. Right. Uh, and it was wonderful. And even though Lara was only three, she carried her own little backpack, the same one that she then carried around the world for two years. Um, you know, and they were pretty proud of themselves. They did, they did all right. Um, so, you know, just having that experience was mm. like, we can do this. We can do it. Brilliant. When you're doing your research, don't just do your research for the travel, but you, you really should try and get in touch with people that have done it, that mm. are doing it. I, you know, I would be more than happy to sort of lead people to the amazing Facebook group called mm-hmm. Families on the Move that uh, that we joined, and that that changed that changed our second year completely. It changed our perspective. It made us go to countries we wouldn't have gone to just to meet people. Yeah. Uh, and those people are still our friends. You know, we yeah. we we'll see them in different parts of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, I would um, I would say. For schooling, um, don't try and replicate school at all. Right. Um, you know, look look for some of the things that I've mentioned. You know, um, and uh, and and you know, don't beat yourself up because because it is it's not that easy. But if you just keep adapting until you find what works and and you know, be a little bit child led and understand yeah. that you know. It's not that easy, but it's <laughs> not that, you know, remember what the teacher said to me. It doesn't matter if they don't really do too much. They are going to be learning anyway. Right. Um, and um, what else would I say? Um, f- possibly the biggest thing for me is, you know, 34 countries, woohoo. Um, actually, if I did it again, I'd probably only do 10 countries um, because... That's- the highlights for us were where, for me, were where we stayed longer. Right. We got immersed in the local community and we did volunteering and we got to know people and we made friends and we became a part of the place. Right. Yeah. And uh, I can see that being easier. I mean, hmm. obviously, one thing that you were trying to achieve that year as well was trying to get your head back after the corporate world, wasn't it? And try and totally. relax and get back to yourself. Yeah. Um, so if you did it at a slower pace, it would enable that, I think. I, I really, one of the things I really wanted to do was I wanted to stop in New Zealand, which would have been about a year in. And I wanted to put, oh, 
Back. I can see you. I wanted to. Um, I wanted the kids to go to, um, you know, a little school in the North Island of New Zealand, and I wanted us to settle down. And I felt that I needed that time to sort of reinvent myself, work-wise and career-wise. Um, and I had all these ideas for stuff that I might do online to become a sort of digital nomad. Um, but I didn't feel that I could do that whilst schooling and traveling and everything else it just wasn't happening plus I felt the kids needed that base back to school normality and it would be an incredible experience to to do something like that somewhere like New Zealand um, you know and who knew where it would have led yeah and, and I do I still regret not doing that um, I think that would have been amazing and 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 you know could have opened a lot a lot of doors but uh, we'll never know because we kind of keep going. Yeah. Don't you do it again mm-hmm. exactly yeah exactly. that's the thing you know you're not dead yet yeah there's still time <laughs> <laughs> um, so if people want to find you know find out more about your journey because you've only touched on a couple of countries here and there's so many you went to and so many more experiences where, where could they go and, and investigate more on that so um we kept a blog um it's it's got a bit more information from the first year because i was better at writing the blog in the first year and it's sort of <laughs> out as it all became a bit you know kind of uh, tougher in the second year but um nonetheless it's all there um so that's online and you can share details of that i think can't you George? yeah I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes yeah, yeah. And and if they want to ask you a question directly, what's the best place to do that? Very welcome. They can track me down on Facebook if you can give my Facebook details. Okay, as well. I'll give you a link to that as well. Brilliant. Happy to hear from you. Yeah, cool. Well, no, that was it's very been, inspiring. Very inspiring, definitely. And we'll be definitely having a bit of a chat about that this evening over a glass of wine because yes. my oldest is in year six at the moment, so our window is closing. <laughs> Just apply for year seven. So it's like, okay, what have we got? <laughs> Oops. Not quite a year. Yeah. Um, so I just want to say, you know, thank thank you so much for coming on the show and just sharing some of your experience there. Um, it's absolutely amazing. It's going to be really inspiring to a lot of people that, you know, where travel um, is high mm. on the agenda. And we certainly love travel. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think like some people, once you have, well, with us, once we had children, we've actually kind of almost stopped the travel part. Mm. Um, But previous to that, we were traveling, visiting countries all the time, you know, we'd visit like five or six countries in a week, you know, it it was that kind of thing. Um, So thanks again for having you on the the show. Um, And for everybody else, you know, thanks, thanks to listening um, to the Sarah and George Joy Property Podcast. Please subscribe to our channel, um, share it with your friends and um, goodbye for now. And we'll speak to you all next week. Thanks, Mo. Thanks everyone. Bye.